Car crash cases, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts. The attorneys with Josh Wright from the law firm of Hollis Wright and host David Lamb. Good evening and welcome into the attorneys. Thank you so much for joining us on this Sunday evening. For the next half hour, we have a panel of experts assembled ready to deal with the topic of family law and we'd love to have you join the conversation. There are ways you can call, text, email that you'll see at the bottom of the screen. And don't forget the neat thing that Hollis Wright does each and every Sunday night. They have attorneys standing by live right now all throughout the show just to speak with you. So if you call that number and want to speak with a uh, an attorney all fair confidential conversation you can take advantage of that opportunity as well leading our conversation as he often does he's managing partner of the firm of Hollis Wright Josh Wright good to see you sir good to see you too did you have a good week I did you uh, outstanding excellent um, been a great week and you know good. Um, we do a lot of shows David on a uh, various number of topics uh, we keep coming back a lot of times to shows involving family law and family related issues because we get a lot of questions related to family right. law issues. And so tonight we're going to put a different spin on a show we've done in the past Good. related to family law and we're going to be probably a little bit more heavy on uh, some specific topics that we hadn't really covered in the past. Um, we're super lucky uh, tonight because we've got Sarah Tower uh, on with us uh, with the Stover Law Firm. Um, uh, here in town, and um, we're going to be talking about family law related issues. Now, this is the first time you've been on the show. This is. All right, you mentioned earlier you could be nervous, but I know <laughs> well, you're not. A little bit nervous. But, but I know you're not going to be. Because no. here's the best part you're the expert, and we're, yeah. we're really just listening to you because you know so much about this topic. Let's, let's, let's first jump off this way. Um, how did you get involved in this area of the law? Because, I mean, it's a specialty. Not everybody comes out of law school and says, I'm going to do family law related issues. You know, because you got to have an emotional side to deal with clients, but you also have to have the legal knowledge to be able to lead, guide, and direct them. How did you get into this area of the law? Well, um, originally I was first licensed in Michigan, and the law firm that I worked at, they did family law practice and criminal defense. So I kind of started in the criminal defense realm, and it kind of pulled me into the family laws. It kind of, you know, intertwines with each other. So I kind of stuck with the family law when I moved down here to Alabama. And so, are, you mentioned Michigan. Uh, you were licensed there and practiced there uh, in Plymouth or outside Detroit? Yeah, in Plymouth, okay. Michigan, and I went to law school in Ann Arbor. Okay, so um, are the laws in Michigan from a family law perspective all that different than Alabama, or kind of the concepts the same? The concept, I'd say, is pretty much the same. I mean, procedurally, there's just a couple things that are a bit different, but I guess overall, I'd say it's pretty okay. much the same. Do you specialize in one area of family law, for example, you know, whether it's divorce, child custody, or do you kind of cover the gamut? I cover both. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't do anything like adoptions or whatnot, but okay. just child custody, modifications, or okay. contested, uncontested divorces. All right, so let's address this issue because we will get this question immediately, and that's this. There has been a change in circumstance, and I don't make the same income that I used to make and I'm paying X in al or child support, um, can I get a modification uh, because there's been a change in circumstance or a lost job? How does that process work? I didn't know. Yeah, I mean, like for example, if, if my income changed and I'm supposed to, for example, have, you know, I'm paying $1,200 a month for, you know, some form of child support itself uh, and I, my income changes and I have a significant reduction um, can I go back to the court and get a modification? How does that process kind of work? Yes, you can. Okay. So yeah, it's your responsibility so if your income does change that you have to file a petition with the court in order to you know, notify them that your income has changed so that that way you can have your uh, child support amount that you're paying deducted. So a lot of people I think have this concept that if something's changed, I can do this on my own and just not pay as much as I used to. I mean, you have to go through the court. You have to, because yeah. Because once the court sets up those those custody and child support requirements, you've got to kind of follow that. You do. All right. Um, you know, it's interesting when th there are always changes in the law and, and, and things that uh, are, you know, can be adjusted. But once you have a final order from a court related to child support, uh, you got to follow that unless you get the court to go change it, right. which is interesting. We love getting questions from folks. A question we've got here, is there a specific age where a child can decide what parent to live with? 
Uh, not in Alabama there isn't a designated age. Um, though there isn't, a judge will take into account where a child prefers to live. Um, it depends on the age of the child and the maturity. Um, if a court finds that the child's preference isn't in their best interest, um, they won't respect the request and, and follow what they believe to be the best interest of the, will, of the child. Will a court try and um, have a dialogue and conversation with children as young as six, seven, eight, nine? I mean, have you seen that in court where the judge may sit down and talk with them individually? I mean, how does that work? Because I always yes. wonder, you know, and like when a child becomes 16, 17, they're a lot more capable of vocalizing what they want to do and what they don't want to do. I mean, courts prefer not to include a child into the actual, you know, custody disagreement um, if there is one. Try to keep them away from the courts, but if there is a circumstance where they do need to talk to the child, the judge will talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they really prefer not to put them on the stand, you know, as obviously that's a lot for a, for a kid to handle. So if there are questions the judge just wants to ask, then that's something that they try to do just one-on-one. -on -one. Is a, is a um, in a child custody related issue, is a guardian appointed to protect the interests of the child or does the court handle that on its own? How does that work? Yeah, the court appoints an attorney, um, which is called a guardian litem or guardian for the suit. Uh, they do that to protect what's the best interest of the child. So that way that the guardian at litem will do an independent and thorough investigation uh, to see what's, you know, to protect the child's interest and to advocate on that child's behalf in case that there's some sort of custody dispute, uh, dis there's a dependency issue or termination of parental rights. All right, so child support, how does that process work? Because we, we get this question a lot too when we do shows like this. Is it based on some code section? I mean, is there a schedule that applies? I'm not asking for actual dollar amounts and maximums and minimums. I guess I'm just asking in general terms. How, how, does, the, how does the court, how is the court guided in that issue? Um, it's usually based on the uh, spouse's income, so just to see if there's a discrepancy in that and the amount that the child spends with each parent. So if there's one, the child spending more time with one parent than the other, then the one that's, you know, maybe not the primary custodian um, is going to have to, you know, to balance out the incomes is going to have to pay some sort of child support. And so I guess it, it, it's not really a plug-in kind of formula, it kind of, you know, it's discretionary. And do both parents, um, is their income taken into consideration for pur purposes of child support? I mean, it's like a mother and father, both uh, parents have their child support or their responsibility, um, whoever's going to end up paying child support, is the parent uh, income from both sides taken into consideration? Yes, because, okay. you know, it's not always that everyone thinks that just because, you know, the father can be more of, I guess, unquote, unquote, breadwinner, yeah. you know, that's not always the circumstance, as we know in this day and time, women can make as Absolutely. much, if not more, than a man can Absolutely. make. So. so I know we're getting ready to go to break. Yeah. When we come back, I want to I want to go a little bit deeper into that topic. We're also going to talk about issues of alimony and whether or not the laws have changed related to alimony, when you can start to get alimony if you've been married and unfortunately go through a, a divorce, uh, what rights you have. All right. We're stepping aside for our first break of the evening. A great time to remind you about the social media activities of Hollis Wright. If you're not following them on Facebook, just search the term Hollis Wright. You'll find them there on Twitter. It's Hollis underscore Wright. Uh, we've got more of the attorneys coming right up. Stick with us. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm. Thank you for watching The Attorneys. Now, we hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case. But if you do, the goal of the show is simple. Provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free, so if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury-related topics, you can call, email, or text us. Or you can also follow us on Facebook or Twitter, or simply contact us by going to hollis-right.com and click on the Contact Us link. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us watching The Attorneys.
Welcome back into the attorneys. Appreciate you spending some time with us tonight. Hey, a reminder, attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by live right now to speak with you. So if you uh, have a question and want some uh, free legal advice, it's off the air, it's confidential. Uh, those questions, that conversation is not going to make its way on air. Take advantage of that opportunity. You see the phone number there on your screen. You know, and one of the things that we have started talking about on the show, David, is if people have related topics to this issue tonight, mm -hmm. uh, related to family law, you know, we've got Sarah here, we can answer those legal related issues. Uh, but if they've got a legal related question that is unrelated to family law, they can ask that too tonight. And we're here uh, with lawyers standing by to be able to answer those calls, texts, emails, et cetera. And I often mention, you know, we try and get to every call, email, or text, but uh, if we can't get to it that night, it may be the next day. So just as long as people will be patient with us. They'll do it. All right, so Sarah, when we went off, we were talking about some of the uh, child support related issues. And I want to ask a couple follow-up questions related to that. One relates to, in a child support context, um, if uh, there has been a modification, um, can the parents kind of agree with one another on what that modification should look like um, and then submit a consent order to the judge for evaluation and can they sign off on that? Yes. Okay. Um, it would just, I mean, if you already have a settlement agreement in place and you want to make an amendment, so you would just put the, you know, um, consented agreement to the uh, to the court and okay. they'll most likely accept it unless they find that there's an issue or something that should be addressed, then, then they'll notify the parties. And so I'm assuming the court is probably looking at the guidelines that are required for um, uh, where uh, uh, someone's payment should be to make sure that it's consistent with the guidelines? Yes. Okay. I mean, there's no exact formula, yeah. but it just kind of depends on the parenting time overnights, who the primary custodian is, and the, uh, each of the spouse's income. We talked about a little bit about modification for income changes. How about modification of custody? For example, a parent had to go get help and get assistance somewhere, they got that. Can there be an application made for custody changes too, where we go from rather than sole custody to joint related custody where both parents have a little bit more involvement? Yeah, there has to be a change in circumstances in okay. order for that to happen. And so I'm assuming the court evaluates that on its face no different than what they would with change circumstances from an income perspective, et cetera. Yes. Okay. And let's also talk about this because I know we get this question a lot. When does child support generally end for a child? Is it a certain age of that child and can that be modified? Um, if the age in Alabama is 19 or okay. it can be depending on uh, when the child has graduated from high school or when they become emancipated, whatever is the later, um, but it is the responsibility of the parent who is paying for that child support to file that modification to stop paying because if you don't file it, you're going to have to continue paying until you do something about it. All right, so that's important. Let, let, go back through that because I, I do think that's important as it relates to once the child turns 19, the obligation doesn't end unless you go and ask for a modification. That's correct. You'd have okay. to file a petition to modify. That's a, I mean, that's pretty significant. It is. Some people may not actually realize that. So you get good free advice on this show. <laughs> right? How about, How about that? that? Yeah. Um, talk to me too, real quickly about college. I, I feel like there's been maybe a change in the way that's worked over the years. Um, does the child support obligation govern who pays for college or how, how does that work in general? It doesn't. Um, in about 2013, I believe it was, they um, made it unconstitutional to enforce a parent to provide or pay for uh, college tuition. I mean, if the parties agree to it and put it in a settlement agreement, you know, they're, they're more than, you know, they can do that if they prefer to do that. Okay. But under Alabama law, it's not enforceable as it's considered to be unconstitutional. All right, now, we get this question every single time when we talk about alimony, okay? So let, let's address this. Do you have to be married in Alabama for 10 years in order to get alimony, or can you get it earlier? Not necessarily. Okay. I mean, you, it is possible to get it earlier, but usually the courts do look at the 10-year requirement. Okay. What, explain, I mean, we've talked a lot about custody um, and child support and those obligations. Really, really, what is alimony? How, how does that process work? It's more of a, a payment towards your spouse uh, that 
that may not be able to support themselves. So say that the spouse has been out of the workforce for a long time, it's kind of a temporary payment to provide to them to help them get back on their feet. And is it something during a divorce proceeding that one side makes application for and the court evaluates certain guidelines? I mean, how does that generally work? Yeah, I mean, most of the time when any kind of divorce proceeding, whether you've been married two years or 20 years, usually there is the, the, the topic of alimony does come into play and, and some parties are more than happy to pay it and obviously some are not yeah. so much. So it kind of just depends on that person. Um, I think it was effective January 1st. They've, Alabama's kind of switching to the majority of states, going to what's called rehabilitative payments, okay. kind of steering away from that long-term or lifelong al alimony payment. And uh, it's more for a max of five years that they're, that they're trying to do. Um, that rehabilitative payment, again, is just to help that spouse who's been out of the workforce um, get back on their feet and you know get back into the job market. But that's not always an option, so mm -hmm. it just kind of depends. Because mm -hmm. if somebody's been married for 20 years and never worked, they're not really considered to be rehabilitative. Right. Gotcha. Okay, uh, question we've got here, and the best questions always come from you all. Question we've got, what has changed regarding the treatment of retirement accounts? Well, uh, effective, I think it was January 1st, um, the retirement account, there was a requirement of they had to be married for 10 years in order to share into uh, one of the spouse's retirement accounts. They have eliminated that requirement, so it kind of gives more uh, discretion to the courts on the apportionment of those retirement accounts. Or the spouses to share upon. So now you don't have to be married for 10 years in order to share? No. Is there, is there some uh, requirement like it has to be two years, five years, or is it within the discretion Just of the court? Just completely in the discretion of the court. Okay. So. And, and so uh, one of the things you mentioned before, and I know we're getting ready to go to break, but let me just ask one more question quickly. You know, you, we've juxtaposed, if you will, a little bit about Michigan law in Alabama, how there are some similarities and some differences. Uh, as it relates to alimony, you said um, that Alabama is starting to go to more of the majority states. Was Michigan more like where, Al where uh, the alimony issue is going with Alabama? Yeah, it was okay. definitely, it, there wasn't this uh, more push towards getting alimony in uh, Alabama, or okay. sorry, up in Michigan. Michigan. Um, it was more the rehabilitative payments of kind of doing like a max of five years, so. Interesting, and that's new. I mean, that's, yeah. that's coming in 2018, so uh, when we come back, let's talk a little bit more about kind of some of these issues related to family law. It's, it's, it's good stuff. And we're coming back. Our final break of the evening is right here. Reminder of, for you of how you can get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you. Stay tuned. The final segment of The Attorney is coming right up. I'm attorney Carter Clay with Hollis Wright Law Firm. If you've ever been involved in a civil lawsuit or been a witness to an accident, then you may have been asked to give deposition testimony. In this week's Legal 411, we are answering the question, what is a deposition and why am I being asked to give one? Depositions involve the process of a person giving under oath testimony that is outside of court. The person giving deposition testimony is referred to as the deponent. Depositions are taken in the presence of a court reporter and the court reporter records the testimony. After the deposition, the attorneys for the parties received a typed transcript that contains all the questions that were asked by the attorneys as well as the answers given by the deponent. The purpose of taking depositions is to ensure that the attorneys for the parties have a full and complete understanding of the events giving rise to the lawsuit as well as an understanding of the testimony that they can expect to hear from witnesses at trial. Another reason an attorney might want to get deposition testimony is that it allows the attorneys to better prepare for trial and to develop a strategy for presenting the case to a judge or a jury. At trial, the deposition testimony can be used in several ways. First, if a witness on the stand deviates from the deposition testimony, an attorney can use the deposition to impeach the witness. Also, if a witness forgets certain facts or events, the deposition can be used to refresh the witness's recollection. 
Finally, in some instances when a witness simply cannot attend trial, the trial judge has the authority to allow the deposition testimony to be read to the jury. If you are a party to a lawsuit and are requested to give deposition testimony, your attorney will likely spend a significant amount of time preparing you for the deposition process to put you at ease and make you feel comfortable. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching the attorneys on WBTM 13. Bibb County with the big families. Welcome back in to the attorneys. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Hey, this is our final segment. So about seven, eight minutes remaining in the show. So if you want to take advantage of that opportunity to get some free live legal advice, attorneys from Hollis Wright standing by for the next 10 minutes or so. Josh. All right, so uh, Sarah, talk, talk with me about this. Um, alimony, can someone who's paying alimony deduct that on their taxes? According to uh, the new federal law that was uh, implemented in December of 2017, uh, for those who are federal taxpayers will no longer be able to deduct that alimony payment. It's kind of shifted the burden to them and those that are the recipient uh, or the beneficiary of alimony payments are no longer having to pay, uh, to pay taxes on, on that alimony payment. So, so it's, it's not a taxable of, event for them either? No. So well, that's that, more of a benefit to them. Yeah, not, yeah, exactly. They don't have to pay taxes so on that's, it. So that's, is that a pretty significant change in the law? I, I'd say so. I'm sure a lot of people aren't going to be too pleased about it yeah. if you're the, the payer. Yeah. So. so we just did some shows on taxes and mm -hmm. we talked a lot about the changes we in did. the law. Just another shining example. Seems like each show there's something different that's changed related to tax related issues. Yeah. Uh, the taxes affect everybody. That's right. Um, a question we've got here. I guess this uh, this is somebody that they're just ready to get a divorce right here. What is the <laughs> fastest timeline I can get divorced in Alabama? The fastest time is 30 days. So That's that quick. would be more of a uncontested divorce. So usually if parties are in agreement to pretty much everything in, in regards to their property, uh, child support or parenting time, they submit the complaint the answer and waiver, um, acknowledgement of non-representation if you just have one attorney doing the paperwork, the divorce decree, and the settlement agreement. So if you provide all those documents to the court, file them within 30 days, you should be divorced. Do you have the ability in Alabama to get remarried if you've gone through a divorce to the same person? Uh, yes, eventually okay. you can. Eventually you yeah. can. This may be a time frame. Interesting. <laughs> And another interesting question we've got here um, about moving. We, we kind of get this one a good bit as well, but do I have to provide notice to my child's mother or father if I decide to move? Yes, you do. Um, it mostly pertains to those who are moving the 60 mile marker. So if you're moving 60 miles from your child's child's current residence, you do have to provide written notification um, to the other spouse notifying of your move. Uh, this notice needs to be provided usually about 45 days um, before the actual move. The, the party who receives the notice can object. They have 30 days to object to this move. And if they want to change the custody agreement, either like the visitation or who's the primary custodian, um, they're going to need to file a petition of mo uh, for modification with the court for that. Do you find a lot of times that um, a husband and wife who thought they could figure all this out on their own end up coming to you after they've kind of gone down the wrong road and you're cleaning messes up? I mean, does that happen a lot? It does, okay. it does. Or there isn't some sort of agreement in place or in the court. So, you know, it's just kind of an oral agreement where, you know, you pick up the kid on this day, drop them off that day, I'll throw you $100 here and there every right. week. That's usually when, you know, eventually you're gonna get to a, a train wreck. So it's really important to file something with the court. That way you have something in place that you yeah. can follow. 
And do you recommend that getting a lawyer involved early in that process is important? I mean, is that kind of critical to solve the issue of potentially creating messes and having to clean them up? I do, especially when you've got children involved. You know, you have the intention, you know, the uh, you have the, the good intention of, of having a good agreement between parties and working it out, but sometimes even with that good intention, yeah. you know, it doesn't always have a good resolution How unless you, you have manage, a lawyer. And, and, and I know we get this, you know, not exactly the question, but David a lot of times will raise this issue of the difference between the business side of this area of the law and the emotional side, because a lot of times when you're dealing with issues of custody, child support, alimony, there's a lot of emotion, I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, because it's a yeah. maybe a failed marriage and there's a lot of emotion. How do you take yourself out of that and manage the business side of that for folks? I mean, that, it's not always easy, I know. No, and even as a lawyer, you're not just an attorney, you are a counselor, yeah. and sometimes you are a kind of a marriage therapist, and yeah. you definitely have to, to remove yourself from that and just look at what is the best interest of my client, what's the best interest of these children, mm -hmm. and focus on that. So by, by, by being able to remove yourself from that and just seeing it, I guess, more on paper. I know how cold that sounds. Yeah. Yeah. It really is in the best interest of the parties if you if you can yeah. be an attorney in that, I guess, have that perspective. Well, and sometimes I explain to clients, I know we're getting ready to wrap up, but sometimes I explain to clients, you know, on the personal injury side, that, you know, my responsibility is to manage the business side of the lawsuit. The emotion will come when we go try that case, right. but right now we're gonna manage the business side, and a lot of that is what Sarah's dealing with. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, just a couple of minutes remaining, just about out of time, but just enough time for a final thought from both of you, and Sarah, if you would, you, you go first. Your final thought for our viewers. Uh, I just wanted, I guess, thank everyone for having me Absolutely. on the show. This is a really fun experience. Uh, I understand that it's not always uh, cheap to have an attorney represent you, but I do really emphasize that it is important, especially when you're dealing with ch custody issues right. or child support issues, or you have a lot of property that needs to be divided. It's just I really, really got to press that it's important to at least talk to a lawyer, try to get at least a free consultation just to kind of give you an avenue or a direction that you need to go with with your uh, and, custody. And I would tell you, that, that's a good point. Um, I, I'd say this, a lot of times I get friends of mine or people that we've represented in the past call me for advice related to family law related issues because they just kind of assume, there's nothing wrong with this, but they just kind of assume that um, lawyers understand all areas of the law and the reality is it doesn't work that way right. and although we may be able to give some general advice on hey you need to go get a modification don't do that just with your ex-spouse alone you need to go get an actual modification you need to get the court involved advice like that is simple um, but you really need people that are experts like Sarah right. involved in this type of stuff because those are the folks that understand the way the family court judges work, understand how modifications actually transpire and how you can get an agreement um, uh, where the, the, the folks agree and get it approved by the courts. So you right. need to go through the experts to do that. So get to folks like Sarah. Excellent, excellent advice. Thank Thanks you. For your time. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for joining us as well. Appreciate it as always. As we wrap things up, here's how you can get in touch with Hollis Wright. They would love to hear from you. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time right here on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.